Hi, um, I'm Nona Willis-Aronowitz. I'm a journalist and contributor to NBC News where I report on education and poverty. And I've been sort of preoccupied with my own generation, the millennials, pretty much since everything went to shit in 2008. <laughs> um, Let's start there because um, this was kind of like an aha moment for me. I'm 30, I was a few years out of college and the economy crashed right as Obama was getting elected and it was this um, really emotionally intense moment for me and everyone around me. We were kind of, I mean this was like our JFK assassination, like our Vietnam and I guess more to the point our depression where I just knew that this moment was gonna define the way we looked at the world for many years to come. And not every millennial was young and was um, old enough to vote at that point, but we were all sentient humans and we knew that there was sort of this open global panic about the economy and what was gonna be, um, and how it was going to affect our job prospects and in turn um, our, prospect, our American dream prospects, I guess, to borrow the term from um, to sort of, you know, continue the, term, the theme from the last panel. Um, when I became a journalist um, and a reporter, I just sort of naturally gravitated towards figuring out what was going on with our generation, and I quickly um, dubbed us the crash generation because um, it's, as I said, it, this moment really defined this moment of. Um, severe recession that we're still in that sort of accelerated a lot of the economic patterns of the past several decades. The chickens really came home to roost right as we were trying to create a life. Um, and there have been all these studies saying that you know we're materialistic or we're obsessed with money or we're obsessed with entrepreneurship. But what what I really think is that we're obsessed with this money that we can't have. You know um, that we're sort of. Um, another way to say that, I guess, is class consciousness. We have this class consciousness because we sort of have to have this class consciousness. Not only um, low-income millennials who grew up low-income, because um, every low-income person has class consciousness, you really don't have a choice, but also these sort of downwardly mobile millennials that we've been talking about um, who thought everything was going to be okay, but then all of a sudden they realized it was maybe not going to be okay. Um, income inequality has been part of the conversation for years now. I mean, between Occupy and you know Mitt Romney's slip-ups and um, just our everyday experience of sort of um, realizing sort of generational income inequality and also how our generation is is uh, has lots of income inequality within it. Um, when I was, when I became a reporter and I started traveling across the country talking to young people about their economic circumstances, I quickly realized there really was a very deep uncomfortable divide between downwardly mobile young people who were, for, a better, for lack of a better term, broke, not necessarily poor, and sort of the permanent underclass who you know, barely noticed the recession because they'd always been struggling. And now it was just a little bit worse, but it's a lot more dramatic of a fall from like the second to highest rung to the bottom versus you know, second to last rung to the bottom. Um, we, we, I mean, we really, as a generation, um, in one sense, have similar experiences, this common experience of um, being, like coming of age in a, in a depressed economy. Um, but we also, depending on our income and education level, have vastly different experiences. Um, and when we, when we try to get classified as a generation, some of those different experiences come into stark relief. Last year, or I guess now a year and a half ago, I you know, took more than a month to go across the country and sort of see um, what the American dream meant to urban millennials, where they were moving, why they were choosing the cities they were choosing. And I saw a few different things. Um, I saw the tension between um, sort of these entrepreneurial startup -y millennials who are sort of life hacking their way through this economy armed with cultural capital and education, if not actual physical dollars, um, 
And in some ways, you know, they had to be knocked down a rung in terms of their expectations, but in other ways they were doing fine on one hand. And then I saw um, sort of these um, millennials in service jobs or, or low-income jobs who were realizing just how screwed they were and sort of arguing for, it sort of had that op Occupy tinge, right? Like I saw fast food workers arguing for um, a wage raise. I saw minimum wage fights across the country. I saw these sort of fights for an, a, a good economic baseline. And what I realized is that these two groups were kind of talking past each other, which I thought was totally unnecessary because um, those entrepreneurs could really use some sort of uh, secure economic baseline. There'd be a lot more of them if we had that. Um, and I also noticed sort of the um, the I guess consequences of of our risk averse generation. I heard that word several times in the last panel. And really how it's manifested in the way that I've seen it in my reporting is, um, first of all, where millennials are moving. A lot of them aren't necessarily moving to these big cities that we thought that we could previously make it in. We're not necessarily moving to LA or um, New York or DC um, so much as staying put where we were, where we grew up and sort of trying to make those places better. I saw that in countless post-industrial cities like um, Detroit and um, Cleveland and even smaller cities like Harrisburg where these educated kids or maybe not even educated kids, kids that maybe would have been going to a community college but decided, you know, what's the point? They're sort of making their home cities better rather than striving for this old model of economic security. Um, and risk averse also came, kind of came out in this paradox, which I'm going to ask EJ Reedy about later, which is that even though we are the generation that's supposed to be so entrepreneurial and like, you know, a large portion of us really want to start our own businesses, um, we really don't have, we have fewer and fewer opportunities to have that because the social safety net is making it more and more difficult for us to take risks. Um, and we might see a little bit of that change with the, you know, the advent of Obamacare, it's still a little early to see. But, um, but again, these two conversations are, are not mutually exclusive. So um, without further ado, <laughs> um, I'm going to um, give the floor to Bill Emmons, who's um, from the, Federal, the uh, senior advisor of the Center for Household Financial Stability at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Um, and he has a paper in the packet that gives a really good sort of um, overview of the policy landscapes, the policy landscape that, um, that uh, American millennials are dealing with. So do you want to? Thanks, Nona. Yes, um, I'm going to hit some of those themes, and uh, hopefully we can get some get some discussion about that. I also want to pick up on something that uh, my colleague Ray said. Not only that these are my own views, but also. Uh, how permanent are these discouraging income trends that we've seen just during the Great Recession? So I want to uh, refocus that to, to ask how permanent are the changes in the labor market that we've seen? So to do that, I, I first want to describe what economists uh, believe has happened in our labor market and then uh, maybe draw a judgment on why that matters so much for young people and then uh, to the extent to which that is permanent. So first, what has happened in the labor market? Actually, this goes back to before the Great Recession. And so this is one of the startling things is that uh, really the, the housing boom disguised what was going on in the labor market. We think that the real turning point was back around 2000. Um, and uh, that's what's, what's playing out today. But the, the kind of the underlying forces go back even further, maybe a quarter century or more, things like globalization. We had a billion new workers enter the global economy uh, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the rise of China, and other emerging markets. That's had huge effects on our labor markets. Uh, liberalized trade and financial flows, obviously also interconnected uh, our economy with those of, of uh, other parts of the globe. Technological advances were going uh, hand in glove with, with all of that. Information technology, communications. So the result is a very, very different 
competitive situation for workers, for companies in the United States than was faced even 25 years ago, let alone uh, 50 years ago, uh, say when the, the baby boomers were, or their parents were just getting uh, started in the labor market. So these have come together, and this is what economists now are talking about, the polarization in the job market. It's also sometimes called the hollowing out of the job market. The idea being that there are uh, you know, basically three clusters of skills or tasks that uh, workers are asked to perform. Uh, there's the cognitive skill type of job, people who think for a living. There's also uh, a large number of jobs that uh, are routine tasks. These are manufacturing. Uh, or clerical sorts of works, and there's also manual labor, which is uh, important for a person to be there uh, in person, but uh, doesn't necessarily require lots of education. So the hollowing out phenomenon is there seems to be a lot of growth in that cognitive skill part of the market. We identify those with college graduates. There's a lot of growth in the low skill, manual uh, part of the, uh, the market. It's the middle that's gotten slammed. The routine tasks, manufacturing, clerical, things that either can be uh, replaced by a robot or somehow computerized or easily outsourced. And so you have this phenomenon of uh, people with skills doing relatively well over the last uh, couple of decades and lots of growth of low wage jobs, but it's the middle, you know, the so called middle class job uh, that seems to have gone away. So why does this matter for young people in particular? Well, there appears to be, with that context, what, what some economists have called a great reversal in the demand for cognitive skill. So right around 2000s, somewhere around the bursting of the technology bubble in the 90s, it appears that the demand for those uh, college level jobs has stagnated, and, and, and that seems to be true uh, through to today. Uh, and so that means that there's uh, downward pressure on wages, even for college graduates, and there is uh, compression uh, in the wages all across the, the, all labor markets uh, with something that, that some economists call a cascading effect. So people with college skills uh, are not able to get uh, college level jobs and so they're working in jobs that don't require college. That puts pressure on workers with lower skill levels and on and on. The people who would be displaced from those uh, job markets are pushed down to even lower skill and at the very bottom the people with the lowest skills seem to be the ones who are dropping out of the labor force altogether. Now this affects young people most for, for two reasons at least. One, the college attainment has increased dramatically among young people uh, over a long period of time, but especially even in the last few years. So just as the demand for those college level skills seems to have stagnated, we're coming with a, a larger supply, more college graduates who are finding very weak opportunities, and then the, that triggers that cascading effect. The other aspect that's a particularly important for young people is the downward flexibility, if you will, of wages at the entry level, which is much greater. It's easier for employers to adjust their entry level wages than it is to adjust the wages of somebody with more seniority, and that obviously then uh, affects the young workers. So that seems to be kind of where we are today, that even though college graduates uh, are doing better than people with less education, they're certainly not uh, seeing their wages grow uh, like they did in, say, in the 1990s. And there's also uh, a lot of underemployment among college graduates. And as I said, it has these cascading effects on lower uh, skill levels. And so does it, uh, to answer Ray's question, in the labor market context, how permanent is this? Well, it looks, it looks like this is the way it is. This, this has now persisted for at least 15 years. And it looks like... Um, this globalization is not going to reverse. Technology, obviously, is not going to go away. And so it probably means that we will, uh, to hit another theme Ray uh, mentioned, we'll see this, this uh, bifurcation in terms of the income growth, the opportunities that people face. Uh, college education and beyond is still going to be um, relatively highly valued in the market, but uh, 
it's not going to be growing uh, in terms of, uh, again, comparing to the 1990s when there was just a huge uh, increase in the demand and the wages, the opportunities for people with these skills. The growth of those opportunities doesn't look uh, so good looking uh, going forward. And again, going back to that billion uh, additional workers, college and educational levels are, are rising rapidly outside the United States also. So it's, it's a very competitive environment, and there's, I don't think there's any reason to believe that will change. And so, as, as I say, both in terms of the job market and uh, financially, we were sort of uh, fooled by the housing bubble period. Uh, these underlying trends were there all along. They were, they were playing out, and now they've been revealed uh, to be true. And so the crash phenomenon of 2008-2009 uh, was really, uh, in my view, sort of a, a wake-up call. It, now it, it sort of shows us the very, very competitive global economy that we're working in, the, the critical role of skills, um, and you know that that is, I think, what we what we're looking at. Uh, I also briefly in the in the background paper discuss some policy options, and maybe I'll just very briefly touch on that. Maybe we want to come back to it. It, it seems that um, you know, kind of conventional approaches to so what would you do about this uh, just don't seem to uh, be terribly promising in my view. Uh, one idea would be well, lots of more macroeconomic stimulus, but really monetary and fiscal policy, if anything, are probably going to be tighter in the future than they are today. So I don't think we can count on that. Um, some people have talked about uh, raising the minimum wage. And although that would have some benefits for some lower wage, lower skilled workers, it actually uh, hits the lowest skilled workers and disproportionately young workers and uh, uh, people of color hits them the hardest. It would uh, most likely reduce opportunity there. So I don't think that's uh, really an overall solution. Uh, some other ideas maybe we can get to in the discussion, but uh, I think the, the typical policy levers that we might look for uh, are, are not that effective, I think, given that this is uh, really a, a sort of a seismic change in the way the, the U.S. economy operates because it is part of that uh, global economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, I mean, I was sort of, as like a 24-year-old, um, very disheartened to realize that even goes beyond like 2000, I mean, this has been happening for many decades, and sort of the pro proliferation of the service and real retail economy really, again, was a wake-up call in 2008, well, wow, this is really our new reality, and the only thing that the recession really did was sort of bring these issues to the fore, which may be a blessing in disguise considering what, um, I mean, depending on what happens. Um, so let's, I, I'd like to turn the conversation to um, the, the work of Elizabeth Jacobs. Um, I'm, I'm really interested to hear what you, how you feel that income inequality um, and by extension kind of like racial, socioeconomic, and education divides play into this conversation of what, what will become of millennials. Because um, one of my pet peeves when I first started this work is, is um, when people said millennials, like on the cover of Time Magazine or whatever, they were really sort of just using the shorthand of like white, like downwardly mobile millennials, and they weren't necessarily talking about class dynamics within our generation. So can you comment on that? Sure. No. Um, so oh, I'm sorry, introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, my name is Elizabeth Jacobs. I'm the Senior Director for Policy and Academic Programs at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. We are almost a year old, and we are a grant-making institution dedicated to accelerating, accelerating the knowledge of how inequality and other structural changes in the US economy are impacting our country's economic growth and dynamism. So we fund academics, and we also work really hard to figure out how to connect um, top academic research to policy so that we've got evidence-informed policy going forward. Um, so your, your question is, is spot on and actually what I've been thinking about picks up really nicely um, from where we left off and that you know the way that this panel was framed out was kind of um, you know what do jobs look like post-recession and kind of any time anyone asks me that question I have a really hard time answering the question as asked because I, I come back to thinking about everything we know about the economy is really it's been going on for quite some time the kind of main underlying trends that really came to a fore and that we're grappling with in the context of um, a labor market recovery that's been kind of wobblier than I think most workers would like um, the answer really it, it goes back to to what we've already started talking about are trends that have been going on for some time and 
so I have kind of three broad ones in inequality, which was the, the correct question directed at me as where I'll start, and then I have uh, two others that I just want to touch on. And to the inequality point, I mean, just some like basic facts, which I suspect everyone um, in this audience has probably heard some version of, but I always find it good to sort of, you know, start with the basics. From World War II through 1970, incomes from the top to the bottom, it didn't matter if you were in the bottom quintile or the very top, everyone's incomes roughly doubled over that period. The economy grew, everyone's, everyone's incomes grew um, roughly about the same. We still had plenty of inequality. America has never been a, a hugely compressed nation, um, but we were seeing broadly shared growth and prosperity. Starting in around 1970, um, for reasons that we've touched on already in terms of globalization, there are also sort of some major policy shifts that eroded collective bargaining power and sort of institutional changes in the way we did policy. Things changed. And between 1979 and 2010, so sort of post-recession, but this is really about a story pre-recession that just came to afford the recession, um, we saw the bottom quintile's incomes grew by about 40%. The top quintile grew by 300%. So that's like a vast, vast change in what economic growth meant for American families um, and just sort of the lived experience. And so that applies to millennials. It applies to all of millennials' parents. I'm like almost a millennial, so I'm trying to decide if I should say like we or you. I'm not sure. Which will make you like me better? Which one do you like? Post 1980, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and I, I miss it. My little sister is a millennial, so I'm like very close. Um, <laughs> In any case, these are changes, you know, there are reasons to think that they're obviously impacting all of our lives, not just millennials. The fact that they've impacted parents' lives, I think, is important in thinking about the, the generational relationships and what millennials have to fall back on in terms of parental support. Um, but but I, I set all of that out there because that's really a sort of broad context for thinking about um, the economy that we're trying to, to fix is not just you know, a post post recession economy. It's really kind of a bigger a bigger trend, and in that um, inequality context, there are a couple different ways of kind of cutting up this broad concept of economic inequality. Inequality is very abstract, so there are a lot of ways of trying to make it somewhat more concrete. One of them is just this idea of the middle class running to stand still. Middle class middle incomes have grown. They have grown. So I should sort of stop with a period there. Middle middle incomes have grown, but almost all of that growth is due to increased women's labor force participation and increases in women's earnings. Men's earnings have actually been falling at the middle for quite some time. So that's like a really big thing. It's a big thing for everyone. It's been a big thing for a while, but I think it's a particularly big thing for millennials in thinking about kind of the way that those economic changes are impacting the way the millennials are making life choices. I know I think tomorrow there's going to be a discussion about work family um, and how all of that works, and I think taking into um, into account what these economic changes have, have meant, and sort of how they've incentivized or not incentivized say, making choices about family structure, about when you have kids, all of that really sort of ties together and I think is, is under this inequality umbrella. And then the other, uh, the other way that I'll talk briefly about inequality that I think has implications for what we're thinking about in terms of the future of the labor market is this runaway rich con concept. I mean, there's the, the middle classes remain basically flatlined, and the real kind of story in terms of the rise in inequality, particularly in the last decade, has been all about the top just totally running away from the rest of the income distribution. And, you know, there's one version of that, um, one take on that story that says, well, it doesn't really matter. You know, Americans, that we like it when people do well. America is all about being able to succeed beyond your wildest dreams. And so we should really be worrying about what's happening at the bottom, in the middle, and if we've got some like super rich people who are now like not just super rich, they're like uber rich, then like great, that's fine. I would argue that I think there's good reasons to be concerned about having the rich pull incredibly far away from everybody else. And there's you know there's a long list of reasons why, starting with basic kind of social cohesion and having a society where everyone's kind of experiencing some semblance of the same existence. But setting aside that kind of more kumbaya version of it, I think there are also some economic reasons to be really concerned concerned about having a rich that's pretty detached from the rest of the country. Um, some of that is in terms of the kinds, the ways that people have made their money and where money is kind of sitting at the very top of the distribution isn't necessarily um, 
being productively distributed downward in terms of job creation. So that's one piece. You can also just think about we tax money at the top very differently. The ways the people at the very top have made their money have, um, have come in forms that because of the way our tax code is written are taxed at a much lower rate. So we're actually, as a country, as a society, in terms of the resources, we're able to then put back into public goods like education, um, like you know, social insurance policies, all of the, the safety net kind of things that we'd like to see in addition to the skills and job training, um, sort of human capital development stuff that I think we'd also like to see. We don't necessarily have the resources that we should if we were actually kind of taxing everyone and all different kinds of income in the same way. So there's a lot of, a lot of conversation to be had about why we should care about top end inequality, but um, I think often that piece gets lost or gets kind of shoved aside as like a really crazy lefty thing to say. And I come at this not, I don't think it's a crazy lefty, but as someone who's really trying to figure out why inequality matters for economic growth. Because ultimately what's going to create jobs for millennials, for everybody, is growth and figuring out kind of the different levers that we have and what kinds of problems are problems in this context. I think kind of bringing that back into this conversation is really pretty important. So that's my inequality piece. Um, the, the second piece is instability, and again, this is something we've touched on already, um, both, I mean, already on this panel and in the prior panel, but we know um, prior to the recession from, you know, basically the same period that inequality has been rising, family income volatility has been rising as well. And now that's like a no-brainer after the recession, like many, many, many people saw their incomes completely fall apart, and it became like a not interesting conversation to have, but as someone who was very much part of that conversation in, you know, really like the decade before the recession, I can tell you that it was like a hotly contested topic, this idea that family incomes were less secure than before. And when I say that, I mean there are a bunch of different ways of measuring it. But just this idea that your year to year or your two year, or your five year income as an individual or as a household might bounce around. So you know you can imagine having pretty stable income, but then you also can imagine you know your income is cut in half for there are a variety of reasons why you can see that happening. Um, and there was real debate. Um, in the economics profession as to whether this was like a thing or not. Should, was it a thing and should we care? And then the recession happened and everyone stopped arguing about it because obviously it was a thing and we should care. And so it sort of like became less interesting. But I like to point out that it like, it's actually wasn't new to the recession, this idea of having families' income swing around pretty wildly. So just to give you a concrete number for how to think about this, um, one way of measuring income volatility is just this idea that your income would be cut in half over the course of a year. Um, so a 50% drop in income. In the early 1970s, you had about a 4% likelihood of that happening by what's, I want to get the date right so I don't give you a bad stat. I want to say it's by 2007. I think that was the last date. It might be 2008, but pre-recession, um, you were up to a 10% chance of having a family income cut in half. So that's a pretty big rise over time, and that's predating the recession. And I think this idea of instability, I mean, incomes are one way of talking about it, but this theme has bubbled up in a lot of different ways that I think is pretty important in thinking about kind of what it means to, to be an American, and particularly a working American. You have instability in terms of incomes. There's increased attention to another thing that people have in a sort of micro community been focused on for a long time and it's become a much broader national conversation now I think about job stability and predictability. So in terms of work quality, which is a huge thing going back to where we started with Anne Marie's opening remarks about work family and flexibility, there are different kinds of flexibility. Employers have a lot of flexibility right now in no small part thanks to technology that lets them kind of map out with algorithms exactly when they need however many workers. As a worker that means that there are many people who have no idea what their schedule is going to be like for the next week, so in some cases for the second half of the week. And you know, I have two kids, I have a lot of flexibility in my life, a lot of flexibility, not that much predictability, but a lot of control over when I am where. And it's really hard even for me to manage that as someone who doesn't, you know, I am economically stable and have flexibility. So when I think about what that means for a family, if you're a single parent and you don't know what you're job hours are going to be the next day. You don't know how much income you're going to have to bring in. It's pretty much impossible to create a stable family life for your kids, let alone high quality 
early education, all of the things that everyone knows that they're supposed to be doing. So that kind of instability theme is the second one I would touch on as a pre-recession and what we're now grappling with in the context of the recovery. And then the last thing um, is mobility. You know, there's been a one more minute for this. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and this is a really quick point because I think we talk sometimes. You hear that our mobility has gone down. I, I think the the best studies suggest that economic mobility in the U.S. Your chances of moving from the bottom to the top haven't changed all that much. But what it means to have flat mobility in a society where the rungs are moving farther and farther apart and where people's economic lives are increasingly unstable, I think means something very different than it did several decades ago, where you had you know a nine percent chance of going from rags to riches. That 9% chance, what that means in the outlook for, for millennials, for our kids, for our parents, is very different than it was in the past. So I will, I will leave it at that. Okay. Um, so we, uh, I mean, I just want to make sure that we get to questions. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to squeeze you guys in in the last few minutes, and then we'll, we'll have 10, 10, 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Um, so I guess you can't really have this conversation without talking about um, education. and and an extension of education, sort of the credentials that people need to, um, to be upwardly mobile, to have a stable income. So quickly, can, can we talk about how, um, how education fits into this conversation of um, sort of how millennials weigh the cost-benefit analysis of um, getting this education and maybe having income um, like reflect that, but then maybe also having loans or having taken taking the time. Okay. Uh, a few minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my name is Rich Dietz. I'm with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. I'm going to try and do this as quickly as possible. So I'm going to address this question of college graduates and ha just uh, you know about this decision about whether to go to college. We've heard. The stories about how tuition has been rising, uh, debt has been mounting, unemployment has risen, underemployment, uh, as, uh, as already been defined, as uh, Bill already talked about, has been rising. It makes a lot of millennials question whether even going to college is worth it these days. And I want to kind of make two, well, three, three points. Um, first, uh, this, it's, if you look back historically, people have always had difficulty transitioning into the labor market. People that enter the labor market in the early 20s after getting a college degree always have high unemployment, always have difficulty finding a job that requires your degree. This transition uh, has been happening for decades. So in that sense, what millennials face is nothing new. Uh, but it's much more common now because the labor market has become so much worse compared to generations past. So it's much more common. Uh, much more pervasive. Uh, but if you're going to do the cost benefit, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. One, what happens to you when you're in your 20s does not determine whether a college degree is worth it. You have to look at what your whole working life is going to be like over 40 years or more. So that's one mistake people make is thinking about what happens right after they graduate is really you know, where to put all the attention about whether a college degree is worth it. The other thing is that what really determines the value of a degree is not how you do now relative to how people did in the past. It's how well you do now relative to how well you do if you didn't have a college degree. And the fact is, that gap between people who have a college degree and those who haven't has not changed. Wages have fallen for the average college graduate, especially over the past few years. That's true. Wages have fallen also for people without a college degree. Prospects for people, especially in terms of finding a job if you don't have a college degree, are poor now, especially compared to the past. That's what you should be looking at when determining whether a degree is worth it. You may not be doing as well as your parents did, but for sure you're going to do better than, you know, on average than if you did not get a degree. Um, the, the last thing I want to make a point of is that not all college degrees are equal. A lot does matter. A big determinant of how well you're going to do in the labor market once you get a degree is what field you're in. So we talk about college degrees as if they're all equal, but they're not. Quantitative uh, degrees, those uh, in fields like engineering, math and computer, things, things that require technical training, uh, the education and health sector, segments of the economy that have been growing for the past decade or more, even throughout the recession. Those are areas in which people who have those majors have much better prospects in the labor market in terms of finding a job, finding a job that requires a degree, uh, and getting good wages. People that have general degrees, liberal arts, communications, this is no rank on anybody who's got these degrees, I'm not saying anything about you guys in particular. But in general, people who have these broader degrees that are not specific, that are not technical, are having a much tougher time in the labor market. What this means is what's different from millennials, it seems to me, compared to past generations is 
going to college and just sort of finding what interests you through the luck of the draw, not getting any guidance, getting a degree in something that seems kind of fun. Uh, that's, that, that's becoming a thing of the past. And I think we're transitioning into a circumstance because of the labor market and because of what's going on now where what you major in is much more important. If what you're worried about is finding a job or if what your concern is about what wages you're going to earn, you have to think more carefully about what your major is. I think that's a responsibility that lies on the parents. It's a responsibility that lies on you as a student, and even more so, I think it's a responsibility that lies in the uh, higher education institutions who I think need to do a better job trying to steer people in what to major in. I know that's going to be a subject of what's talked about later today. <laughs> that's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> um, so um, the last thing I want to bring up before we go to questions is this issue of entrepreneurship, because that's sort of a buzzword that everybody in some ways holds up as the solution to our beleaguered generation. Well, if you can't find a job, make your own job, start your own thing. Um, but the paradox, which I alluded to earlier, is that you know even though this generation has had the most encouragement and exposure to this kind of thing, we all want to be Mark Zuckerberg. We all want to like be a 27-year-old who's making billions of dollars and kind of beat the system. Um, it's harder than ever to really go out on your own, um, given the structure of our economy. So um, EJ, why don't you introduce yourself and then sort of address that point as it relates to the, what, what we've been talking about. Sure, great. OK, well, I feel like Nona stole most of my speech just because uh, <laughs> you know it's actually great to hear somebody coming from a totally different perspective. So my name is EJ Reedy. Um, so I work at the Kauffman Foundation. We're the largest foundation that has a focus globally on entrepreneurship. So, um, so we're obviously very deep into this topic. Now, since I don't have a background paper and you're reading, I just kind of want to get a sense from the audience. Also, I don't want anybody to pull anything as you're transitioning to lunch. So I'm going to ask you to raise your hand here on a very simple question. So when, I talk, when we talk about entrepreneurship, we've talked a lot about the general economy, everything else. How many of you actually believe that entrepreneurship trends within the US economy are now at their highest level um, in terms of historical records? So just a quick show of hands of anybody believes that. It's a trick question. Wow. All right. Um, that is incredible. Um, and so I'm assuming everyone else believes that they're the lowest trends. Well, this is obviously a more informed audience than, um, than, than any I've ever talked to um, in that regard. Uh, well, we're just doing a better job of getting out some of that uh, some of that message. So yes, US entrepreneurship rates um, have been plummeting for a uh, long period of time, um, actually uh, following a lot of the same patterns that were discussed earlier in some, in some instances, uh, view of change kind of starting around 2000, 2001, um, definitely a, a shift beginning about 2006 and have more recently kind of leveled out at what we see as kind of a new low or a new kind of um, level of stagnation in terms of new employer business creation. So there's lots of ways to look at entrepreneurship and uh, you know I don't want to get into, into the nitty gritty um, in, this in this regards, but one of the things that we're focused on are those more um, high growth potential um, businesses. And so that's an area a particular concern and also an area of you know great potential uh, when we're talking about millennials. Now, when Nona was bringing up the um, you know the entrepreneurship paradox, the millennial entrepreneurship paradox, this is something that we've actually been writing about um, more recently, and it is absolutely um, the case that you can see um, trends that are underlying what's happening to the millennial ge uh, generation that could lead you to expect that this will be the most entrepreneurial generation um, ever to occur um, in the U.S. economy. And there's also trends that uh, would lead you to believe that this will be the great lost um, entrepreneurial potential generation. To give you a sense of the kind of exposure that Nana was talking about um, a little bit earlier related to entrepreneurship, um, in 1985, there were about 250 college courses related to entrepreneurship that were, that were taught across the United States. By 2008, that number had reached more than 5,000 courses that were taught on entrepreneurship across college campuses. Now, we ourselves at Coffee and uh, in partnership with other foundations have spent you know more than 300 million dollars um, kind of spreading the word related to entrepreneurship on college campuses and yet at the same time uh, when we look at the particular millennial um, you know the, the aspects of uh, the early career um, entry of Millennials we see both um, both reasons for positivity and reasons for negative uh, for, neg uh, for a negative take on what's going on now when if I'm taking the kind of of, um, 
um, negative perspective on what's happening with millennial entrepreneurship, I would talk a lot about early career job prospects. Now, one of the things that people often forget in entrepreneurship is that when you're looking at kind of the average career pathway towards successful entrepreneurship, Often that actually starts with getting your foot in the door at an established business. It's not the most common pathway to actually be Zuckerberg or others in this regard. It's often a very, very common pathway to get 10 years, 10, 15 years of experience within an established company, know your industry really, really well before you actually jump ship and start your own company. So that's a very um, common and stable kind of uh, pathway for successful entrepreneurs um, in the past. And so obviously some of the trends related to early career prospects have been troubling. And then weak housing mar market and student debt levels. Um, a lot of the things that will be talked about today in, re in relation to uh, long-term trends and impact of student debt, um, you know, as it relates to, say, maybe you know, reduced uh, ability to purchase a home, things like that. Um, on the opposite side, from the entrepreneurship perspective, um, like home equity and um, your ability to actually leverage kind of credit markets, those are typically things that we associate with higher growth entrepreneurship. So uh, definitely some reasons to be concerned there. On the optimistic side, I already referenced um, the great exposure to entrepreneurship in terms of higher education. Um, obviously, this is the most educated um, generation um, ever. Um, and you know, we all see this perceived kind of tech entrepreneurship boom. Um, whether or not this is actually a boom, I'm not totally convinced one way or the other. Um, and uh, particularly related to barriers to entry, it is as, as easy as ever to start a business, whether or not you need incorporation a lot of people go to LegalZoom or some other uh, mechanism to, to expedite you know, starting a new business. Uh, barriers to entry are really down, um, and you do see actually more uh, new businesses that are starting without the need for any external capital. All right, so with that in mind, I'm just going to kind of wrap up with a few things that are concerning. So while we talk about entrepreneurship, we really, with entrepreneurship, are thinking about the extremes. So Zuckerberg, as an example, is a total extreme, and there is a little bit of a little bit of evidence that you know the particularly hyper young entrepreneurship um, boom is occurring. But when you look at the averages and you look at the averages across the country, one thing that is, is concerning particularly about um, the 20 to 34 year old kind of age group is that in 1996, when you're looking at kind of the composition of people that are becoming entrepreneurs, uh, young people were actually the largest uh, proportion of people becoming entrepreneurs. About 35% of new entrepreneurs were in that age group in 1996. By 2013, that had fallen to 20, uh, 22%. And so that's the kind of lowest uh, percentage of new entrepreneurs that are actually in the younger age group. So we're definitely concerned. We're trying to figure out what's going on uh, with some of the underlying um, levels of debt and other concern. Um, but I think it's still out to say what's going to happen with the uh, millennial entrepreneurship paradox. Great. Well, um, thank you guys for um, cramming in so much information. You guys have so much good stuff that we don't have quite enough time for. But I wanted to make sure that we got um, to questions. We have about 10 minutes, so I think we can take um, a few questions. Now, how does this work that we... Oh, okay. Okay. Um, you right over there. And then how many do I get? Three? Okay. You right over there, and you right over there. <laughs> hey, I'm Tori Stillwell with Bloomberg News. Um, the former panel talked a lot about how this generation is the most diverse ever. I'm curious if, they, if you guys can think of any ways or have any data on how that'll impact the economy on ways we'll see that show up in the economy. Let's take this one. Elizabeth? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think where to start. Well, I mean, so diversity, there's there's a lot of different ways of characterizing diversity. I mean, the I, I think Sarah touched on this in the earlier panel in terms of a substantial number. I don't remember the exact number, but substantial diversity in terms of citizenship status. I think that's got huge implications for the labor market. If you've got some you know, significant percentage of a generation that is not able to work on the books, that has implications um, for those people's lives. It has implications for the economy as a whole. It has implications for what kinds of taxes we're able to actually um, levy. So that's, that's a huge piece of it. And then I think, I mean, the inequality 
piece I actually, when I was um, coming over here this morning, was realizing that I, I'd be really interested to see inequality statistics for this generation. I've spent a lot of time looking at the income inequality numbers and related numbers, but I don't think I've actually looked at them specifically by like a generational um, a, co a cohort analysis. And so I don't actually have an answer for that other um, than to say that it, I think it'd be an interesting question. And I'm, maybe it, there wouldn't be all that much interesting in looking at it that way. But I, I do think that it would be um, it would be good to know because it's a big generation, right? There's a big difference between you know 1980 is the the sort of leading edge, so that's the the oldest group. But there's a big difference. Between between somebody who was born in 1980 and is 34 today versus somebody who just graduated from college or high school, who, I mean, that's all, I think, somebody here can correct me if I've got my cohorts wrong, but I think that's all one generation and the, the experience of those people is, is potentially going to vary. That's what happens when you've got a really big generation. Um, so whether, you know, this millennials umbrella continues to be like the most useful lens for understanding labor market experiences, I think there's potentially a question there. Um, and I'll leave it at that because I talked for a while in my opening remarks. I want to make sure other people get a chance to. Um, do you want to say something? I mean, I, I would like to hear what you have to say about the entrepreneurial side because I feel like that's one of the most sort of the bastions of diversity that we have. A lot of entrepreneurs um, are stratified by class and race. Yeah, so I'd say on the entrepreneurship side, um, you know, definitely within the kind of high tech sector, you're seeing you know huge amounts of uh, global diversity there. I think there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of persistent problems related to gender and, and other kind of racial um, diversity within entrepreneurship. Um, so particularly when you're looking at the more higher growth um, potential, so uh, you know the the gender as an example is still remains pretty close to two to one, um, and a national average related to male to female kind of startups and um, um, and I think that there's um, still a lot to be done, particularly in this regard, to make um, entrepreneurship a little bit more available to everybody. So, uh, so you do see some changes occurring, but um, definitely the, the the baseline is pretty low right now in, in some regards, um, except in immigrant entrepreneurship. So immigrants, you know, continue to you know kind of skyrocket in a lot of the entrepreneurship um, uh, kind of percentages, and um, so we just hope to you know allow that to uh, actually lead to further growth. Here's a off-date question, but who in our room here has put on your uh, knapsack or small suitcase, gotten up and gone overseas, whether it's Europe or Asia or uh, South America, who's taken a trip overseas and, and talked with some of the people who might be our customers over there? Well, we have a, we have a, enough, okay, good. Uh, I ask that because in the, can you hear me? Uh, in our panel discussion so far, we have mostly been looking at our own belly button. That is, where are the customers that are going to be buying these uh, products and inventions that mm -hmm. some of our new entrepreneurs are going to be getting into? I mention this because uh, we have been lagging in the U.S. in coming to agreements with uh, Europeans and the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, International Agreement. Um, these have just been uh, uh, <laughs> Waiting, waiting for someone to, to come see that America has so much uh, technology and, and good products to sell. So for us here looking at the future of uh, millennials, uh, will we uh, encourage the millennials to see that America has hardly been dipping into the world market get in touch with these statesmen and politicians and teachers uh, that America has been lagging in setting up conditions that will open up that market for us. We have about 300 million people in the U.S. There are 5 billion people out there who could be, some of them could be our customers. So it's the think tank uh, operation the voice from the hinterland to say, do your job, uh, set up these international trade and investment uh, uh, relations so that our, our people can get into the world market. Okay. 
Um, good question. I, I think that's exactly right, that part of globalization means the United States has to think globally, and uh, both politically, economically, absolutely. Is that it? <laughs> um, okay, last question, I guess. Uh, hi, uh, Clyde McGrady with the CQ Roll Call. Um, my question is for uh, Ms. Jacobs. Um, you mentioned uh, inequality in our uh, tax code. I was wondering if you could uh, tell us what you think a more equitable tax system looks like when that provides the greatest amount, uh, the greatest economic benefit for the U.S. economy as a whole. Um, well, first of all, even if I had an answer, I'm not sure I could give it in our remaining like 45, 45 seconds. And I'll also say that you know I'm not a tax policy expert. I have a sense of sort of the, the beginnings of the diagnosis, which is that we know that we tax different kinds of income very differently, and that a lot of the income that's accrued to folks at the very top of the distribution has been in forms that we don't tax at the same rate um, as the way that we tax earnings. So I, I guess I would start by saying that if we know that that's you know the beginning of the diagnosis of a problem, then thinking about how we can more effectively um, equally tax incomes without obviously to um, dramatically disincentivizing certain kinds of investment, it's complicated. Um, so this is a, a long way of giving a non-answer and saying that I would put that out there to folks who are interested in looking and thinking about tax policy and sort of take, um, take my assessment of the fact that the way that we tax top, top incomes is potentially one of a variety of ways of kind of rejuvenating, rejuvenating the health of the economy, um, that that's a place to start, but I, I do not begin to pretend to have a comprehensive prescription for, for tax reform. I think there'll be plenty of people in this town um, with, who'd be happy to answer your question more, um, more accurately and more pointedly come in the coming one month. So, yeah. Great. Well, that's all the time we have. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>